Welcome back for another episode of the Trans Atheist with Ariane and don't forget to click the subscribe button. The next item of business will be the introduction of a new committee member. Um, I think it's uh, interesting that he gets to start his first committee day on a nice quiet day. Um, <laughs> that we have nothing controversial here to see. We're gonna name a road after somebody, I think. Um, so we would like to welcome Brian Lorenz, representative. If you'd like to introduce yourself and say a few words. Representative Demetrio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manning and Mr. Lashutka for your testimony. I have two little boys that were both born in a UH facility up in Northeast Ohio, so um, appreciate what some of the work you're doing. Um, I have a question uh, regarding, kind of going to tie in a, another bill in, into this one, but I'm working on another bill that expands employment opportunities for more adults in the law enforcement field, unrelated to this committee, but I bring it up because uh, an opponent, um, a colleague that I serve with here in the House who's opposed to that bill and this bill, um, Brought, informed me on so, via social media about um, a kind of frontal lobe development in children and young adults. And it says frontal lobe development occurs later in boys than in girls, which can increase the uh, risk of making poor decisions. Um, and from what I understand, frontal lobe development for young men uh, can, you know, doesn't occur and fully occur until, you know, sometimes the mid 20s. Um, if that's a, is that a fair and true assessment? And if it is, isn't it concerning that there's any opposition to this bill um, regarding minors, you know, uh, being involved in kind of permanent um, life-changing um, health, uh, health procedures that, you know, we've learned in this committee can have long-term impacts on their bodies um, potentially forever. So just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Thank you, Representative and Chairman. I will respond. Uh, first, to clarify that uh, about the statement of permanent changes, decisions around permanent changes, I think what's um, what you've heard from us already is that there are no permanent medical care, there's no permanent medical care delivered to minors at this time regarding their gender. That would be surgery, and the, the medical treatments that we use are not permanent, they are reversible. Um, your comments or your questions about frontal lobe development are, are near and dear to my heart as a developmental pediatrician, and, and uh, some of what you're saying is accurate that frontal lobe development does take longer in, in males and uh, can extend through and after adolescence. Um, but that also presumes that gender identity is tightly tied to frontal lobe. Um, your frontal lobe does impact a lot of decision making, organization planning, executive functioning. We see it uh, great, uh, greatly impacted in certain types of individuals with, individuals with ADHD. Um, but there is not, to my knowledge, a known connection between frontal lobe and gender identity. And we know that children at a very young age uh, in their development strongly identify with their gender um, well before their frontal lobes are uh, fully mature. So I think it's a little, um, it's not accurate to kind of connect frontal lobe development to the ability to identify uh, what your gender is. Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Demetrio, um, I, have, I have four teenage boys living in my home, so I can empathize with, um, with the, the joy that that brings. Um, but <laughs> And at risk of not uh, throwing any of them under the bus, one of them misplaced his second car key for um, the third time yesterday. And uh, I don't know if that's related to frontal lobe development or not, but the point that Dr. Manny made that I want to reiterate is I would agree with you on your comment that should we be concerned about minors under 18 making irreversible decisions about their future. We, we agree with that. And as Dr. Manny had mentioned, the provisions in this bill um, on banning surgeries, which we don't do, as we've testified, and the medication therapy, which Dr. Manny has alluded to, um, you know, is, is, is reversible. And so our opposition to the bill is based upon both the intrusion in our, in our uh, estimation of government into the practice of medicine, where physicians and other clinicians take an oath to do no harm. That's the first oath they take. And if this was a problem that needed addressing by this, this body, I would think that some of the recourse that's currently available to patients and families, if they felt like they received either substandard care or a care that was not in line with the standards that Dr. Manning had mentioned, would have used the remediation that's currently available to them by either going to the state medical board or other licensing regulatory boards to file a complaint that care was not optimal. And so throughout this process, one of my frustrations has been, you know, is this a, a problem in search of a solution or a solution in search of a problem? I, you know, I, 
The data doesn't suggest that, that what we've been accused of doing actually is occurring. And so if we're opposed to the bill, I think the regulatory requirements around reporting, the new tort action, some of the other components of implications on mental health uh, are our primary opposition. But in terms of surgeries, they're not being performed in our institutions on children under 18. And the medication therapy, as Dr. Manning has testified and others have put in the written testimony, uh, seems to be reversible. Uh, I want to be very clear. Obviously, you're, you're talking mostly about things that don't involve surgeries. Uh, a big impetus for this bill is surgeries, mm -hmm. so I think it's worth being pretty clear. Does the Ohio Children's Hospital Association believe that it should be legal in the state of Ohio to remove the penis and testicles from a 15-year-old boy and or the breasts of a 15-year-old girl to treat gender dysphoria? Through the chair, no. I thought the hearing was going really well, so I want to commend everybody. We're a little over time, but doctor, I believe that you intentionally tried not to answer that question. I'm sorry, I'm neutral on this. I'm trying to be fair, but when a committee member asks you a question, instead of playing a word game on what referral means, I mean, you reminded me of Bill Clinton there for a minute. So I really, I would prefer that you answer the questions directly, okay? Yes, sir. Shall, shall I? Shall I speak again to that question, or should we move on? Well, you're, you're, follow -up? you're not defining it as referral, so tell me what you define it as. A ref so thank you for that question, Chair. I'll respond. So a referral in medical practice is the direct um, – let me see if I can give a specific example from my own practice. Um, when I have reached the limit of my expertise in caring for a child with autism and I no longer feel comfortable prescribing their medications, I refer them directly to a psychiatry colleague in my, pra in, my, in my region or in the hospital. And that is a direct referral. I'm asking you specifically, the specific physician, to do care. It's also a process whereby insurance uh, sometimes requires a referral for, for reimbursement of a service. Um, so it's a very specific practice. We have referral forms. We have documentation. And that's why I apologize that you perceive me as dodging or comparing me to another politician. Um, but that's why I'm being persnickety about this, because it is a very specific practice. And in that specific regard, we are not doing that in our children's hospitals. Well, thank you for defining that so specifically. But you still haven't answered the question. If you are not referring them, what do you call it? Well, I think the question of apologies again, Chairman, the question about do we provide a list of resources? Do we say you can't get that done here, um, but you could get it done there? Is that has that happened in our clinics? It it possibly has over time that we, we would not refer to that as a referral. That's not saying you go to this person. I'm directly sending a referral with documentation to this doctor. Representative Stewart. Yeah, I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. Just a half follow-up here. So I understood your answer to my last question to be that the Ohio Children's Hospital Association agrees with the part of this bill that says it should not be legal Correct. in the state of Ohio to do these surgeries on minors. Correct. So if the bill was only talking about surgeries, you would not be an opponent. Correct. Okay, thank you. Representative King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for your testimony today. Just want to clarify again that you're thank you. You're of the opinion that there's no long term consequences of blockers. Are you aware that the FDA issued a warning in twenty twenty two that puberty blockers may cause brain swelling and vision loss in children? Um, I, Representative Chair, Chairman Lips, um, I am continue to be of the opinion that there are no long-term serious consequences um, for medications that pause puberty. The types of conditions that you describe uh, are sometimes found in incredibly rare instances, sometimes without clear association to the use of that medication and other factors, but um, I stand by uh, the statement that I made about safety. Thank you. Just to follow up. So there's no impact on bone density, brain development, infertility, or genital atrophy? I'm sorry, Representative, the last comment that you made, the last statement, general, oh, genital atrophy. 
um, Representative Chairman, um, there are minor or minimal, as there are with any medical treatment, uh, impacts on some of the things that you listed. Bone density has been studied extensively uh, and is being studied further, actually, in a number of institutions. So there are concerns about uh, some impact on bone density, which, re which reverses or returns to normal when hormones are given um, after puberty pausers or puberty blockers. Speaker, thank you very much for being with us. Um, do you have your transgender son with you? Would you like to introduce them? No, he isn't here today. Okay, no. great. I'll, I'll, moment of personal privilege, I'll brag. He just finished his second year of college up at Case Western. So. Great, congratulations. Yeah. Um, in full disclosure, I've known Ms. Becker for years. Our, te our districts kind of bump up yeah. each other. We're I'm Warren County and Anne is Butler County and has always been uh, active uh, in our region as well-known um, committee questioning. Representative Baker. Through the chair, thank you so much for coming in. Um, it's helpful to hear from someone who has received care in Ohio and who also sees the side of the elected official side. So thank you for bringing your story. Um, I just have one question. Receiving care for your son and your family in Ohio, did you ever feel pressured by healthcare providers, clinic staff um, to choose a certain course of care for your son? To directly answer the through the chair to the representative, to directly answer your question, no, I never felt any pressure. Um, when I was writing my testimony, one of the things I, I went through, um, our discernment points, our, our uh, doctor's visits, our therapy visits, I started to do a PowerPoint timeline of all the things that we went through, my risk assessment, my deliberations, I tried to, I started to think about it. And then I realized, it's none of your business. <laughs> The medical care that I give to my son, respect with, all, with a bucket of respect dumped on all of you. What I do with my child is none of your business. And I really believe that all of you, if you should, you're gonna hear stories today. Uh, I met a beautiful young person, Natalie, here today. You're gonna hear stories today that, that these Ohioans are just gonna dump their lives on you and beg for your permission not to drop the anvil of government on them. And that's not how it should be. It's, it's none of your business what they do. You should feel embarrassed that they come before you and have to tell you their stories. Respectfully, sorry. Audience, you've been good <laughs> until just for a second there. Um, during the last hearing, if you'll recall, we had strict guardrails around outbursts and I would find it unfair to allow you to outburst when we strictly controlled the last hearing. So I'm going to ask that you not do that again. And on the second warning, somebody gets to leave, okay? Because it's not fair. Uh, again, your testimony is mostly focused on drugs, but the bill is far broader than that. I'll, I'm gonna ask you as well. Uh, does the Ohio Psychological Association believe it should be legal in the state of Ohio to remove the penis and testicles of a 15-year-old boy or to remove the breasts of a 15-year-old girl in order to treat gender dysphoria? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Stewart, that's not our role. Uh, the Ohio Psychological Association has not taken a position on surgeries for minors. We are concerned primarily with the behavioral health provisions in this bill. We provide psychotherapy. Psychologists provide psychological care, not surgical care. No position on legal, not legal, just no idea. Mr. Chairman, Representative Stewart, again, we have not taken a position specifically on surgeries related to minors, but we have taken a strong opposition to this particular piece of legislation. Thank you very much for testimony. We'll start the questioning with Representative Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your, your testimony. You know, in, in past discussions on this bill, sometimes there's been some talking past each other with regard to the extent to which some of these surgeries are or are not happening in Ohio. So I guess you've identified yourself as, as a, a provider of LGBT care. Uh, do you yourself perform gender transition surgeries on minors in Ohio? Through the chair to the legislator, thank you for that question. I'm actually only an adult provider of LGBT care. I'm not aware of any Buddy that does perform surgeries on minors. Um, interesting note to that, um, 
We, I do know that for some of my patients, they have suffered from back injuries for years because of large breast growth. And we do try to get them surgeries for that. And we do that for our cis children as well. But no, I do not perform any surgeries. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. And again, I, I don't know if you're, are you testifying on behalf of the Ohio Academy of Family Physicians or are you, you're just saying you're a board member? I am testifying, oh, excuse me, through the chair to the legislator, thank you for the question. Um, I am testifying on behalf of the Ohio Academy of Family Physicians and myself. Okay, and, and so <coughs> short follow up to that. Again, trying to understand where everybody's at with regard to these issues. Uh, does the Ohio Academy of Family Physicians believe that it should be legal in the state of Ohio to remove the penis and testicles of a 15-year-old boy or remove the breasts of a 15-year-old girl in order to treat gender dysphoria? No, I, I'm sorry. Through the chair to the legislator, thank you for the question. No, <clears throat> they, they do not support that. We have not discussed surgical intervention at all in the care of minors. Thank you. Representative Samani. Thank you for your testimony. Um, as someone who provides LGBTQ care, do you, do you feel that the care that's provided is a transition or a continuum of care and that the end result or the end point is not always surgery? The end point may be living as the sex that they feel comfortable in. What, what do you consider the con continuum of care since it's not always an end result of surgery? So through the chair of the legislature, thank you for the question. Um, that's where I can discuss with the patient what their goal is, how far they want to, to proceed. I've had several adults who have detransitioned, not many, that's very few, some who have gone on um, testosterone blockers because they wanted to be less masculine but did not want to assume a feminine role. I've had some people that have gone completely um, the opposite of the gender they were assigned at birth. It's why it's very important for me to have a safe space and a patient to have a safe space to discuss this issue. Um, I'm best able to help the patient decide with them what's the best treatment for them and how far they wish to proceed. Um, through the chair, follow up. So we know in medicine that one of the issues that we face is what we call minority stress theory. It's in PubMed, you know, there's a publication about that, that minor microaggressions, you know, whether it's racist concerns, questions, or microaggressions such as bills like these where certain communities, certain groups are um, marginalized, are treated differently, that those things can also increase suicidal thoughts. Um, how, how do we support these kids, these adults, you know, when 82% of them have thought about suicide, 46 or 40% have attempted suicide? What can we do in Ohio? What can we do to improve those things so these microaggressions that are happening with these laws don't happen? Now, through the chair of the legislature, thank you for the question. Um, as I said, I only do adult care, but my adults are already being affected by this legislation, even though it's not already been enacted. They're very concerned about it. Um, many of them are leaving the state. Um, many of uh, my, the parents that I know of that have trans children are planning on leaving the state if this, if this passes. Um, it's already occurring. They're already feeling the effects um, of the microaggressions. And, um, I must admit, I was a little hesitant or a little fearful, I guess I say, to testify today because the forces that are very opposed to transgender health care are becoming more violent. Uh, Boston Children's Hospital had doctors that had to go into hiding uh, because of the threats that they received through uh, emails and text messages. And I do know that some of the providers in Northeast Ohio also have significant security set up for them uh, in case that there are some aggressions against them for providing this care. Thank you. Thank you. Committee, additional questions? Representative King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here with us today. Our last committee, we heard from detransitioners, uh, young women who had the surgery and regretted, and then are detransitioning. They've shared their personal story of how it's impacted their bone, their posture, uh, possibly infertility and some other more personal side effects. Consent to treatment 
is an important principle in medical <laughs> ethics. Do you feel a child has the competence to consent to, to receiving blockers, which prevent normal process of growth and development, which is potentially irreversible and has potential consequences to their future? Do you believe that a child has the capacity to understand that and give consent? Through the Chair of the Legislature, thank you for that question. Um, I do know that in the children's uh, transgender clinics that I utilize and I have connection with, there is an extensive amount of behavioral health discussion prior to any form of treatment of any kind. I think that they work with the patients and the children to make that decision. Um, as I said, I don't deal with children on a regular basis, but I will tell you that many of my adult patients have said that they knew that they were of the opposite gender as early as five or six years of age. I have one young woman who always relates the story of when she was in Catholic school, and at the end of recess, the nuns would line them up, okay, boys here, girls here, and she would always go into the girls' line and then be dragged out by the, the nun and punished for getting in the wrong line. She identified as a girl even at the age of six. Um, so I, we know that there are, kids can tell the difference between genders at a very early age. And some of these kids are very much aware of what gender they are, irrespective of what they were assigned at birth. A follow-up, thank you. But do you believe that children have the mental capacity to understand the consequences and long-term consequences? I, Thank you, through the Chair of the Legislature, thank you for the question. I do believe that with proper guidance through behavioral health and with the aid of a health provider and the parents, that children can make decisions on their own. Again, with the guidance um, of the health care professionals and the, and the parents. Follow up. So if there was a young person that came to you, someone with an eating disorder, anorexic, and they wanted to have liposuction because their image of themselves was an overweight person. Would you, as their physician, knowing or believing that they had the um, ability to understand and make that decision, would you support that decision in a, in a youngster? Through the chair, to the legislator, thank you for the question. Again. If that situation presented itself to me as a physician, I would make sure that we got behavioral health or psychological help involved first before there was any permanent change to see if that was best for what the patient really needed. Um, as, as a previous speaker said, it's very interesting that young women can have breast augmentation without much criticism, but for a transgender, they can't have the surgeries because they don't, they're not able to make them the mental knowledge of what may be permanent, although we do allow our, our many of our children to have plastic surgery without really considerations. Um. Let me ask it a different way. If someone came to you, a youngster, and they had body integrity identity disorder, mm -hmm. and they wanted to amputate a perfectly good limb, they've gone through the therapy, they still are of the opinion that they feel like they have uh, a non-functioning limb, would you be willing to amputate a perfectly good body part, arm or leg from a young person? Through the Chair of the Legislature, thank you for that question. Again, I would find it very difficult for someone to go through therapy and be told that it was okay to amputate a perfectly good limb. I would have question with that because, again, I would not know what the behavioral aspects of that are. I do not perform surgeries. But I do know that, that would be permanent, um, and it would be more up to the behavioral person and the surgeon if that would be the case. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I do have one question. Several times you identified that you treat adults only. Mm -hmm. Can you give me your definition of adult? Adults are anyone over 18. Okay, and that's limited in your practice? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much for sharing your testimony. Committee? Representative Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'm just curious. You, you mentioned conversion therapy. I, I know there are states that have that have banned this. I think there's some municipalities in Ohio that, that have attempted to do so as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
do you support those bans? Bans on conversion therapy? Yeah. Yes, I absolutely support them, and so does the OCA. Okay. Uh, follow up to that, Mr. Chairman. So is it fair then to understand your position to be that the Ohio Counseling Association supports the state regulating what you can and can't practice, but only so long as you agree with it? Conversion therapy is a human rights abuse. It's different than what you're doing here. Okay. One follow-up. Uh, again, I think most of your testimony has been about counseling, so I'll ask, you're, you're representing the Ohio Counseling Association. Does that association believe that it should be legal in the state of Ohio to remove the penis and testicles of a 15-year-old boy or the breasts of a 15-year-old girl in order to treat gender dysphoria? We are not medical professionals. That is outside of our scope of practice. We are mental health care professionals. So us having an opinion on that undermines our expertise and that of mental health care professionals. You have no opinion on gender surgeries that are part of this bill? Teenagers aren't getting gender surgeries. Well, that's a different statement than you don't have an opinion. I mean, do you think that that should be legal or illegal in the state of Ohio? OCA does not currently have a stance. Do you? I'm not here for me. I'm here for the Ohio Counseling Association. I think it's pretty noteworthy today that not one single organization that has come in to testify against this bill has said that they believe it should be legal to do these surgeries on minors. I'm reading your testimony, and I, you've kind of talked around it as well, but I guess my question is, do you believe these surgeries that I've described previously in this hearing should be legal in the state of Ohio to perform on children? Repre uh, Chairman Lips, Representative Stewart, I think every part of this bill should be thrown out. I think that the medical decisions of 15-year-olds should be left to their doctors and their parents in collaborative treatment. So it should be legal, in your view? That's not what I'm saying. I, I Through say yes the chairman, no, yes or no question. you and I should not be in that room. Through the chairman, neither you or I should be in that room. That sounds like yes. Thank you. I'll give you one more shot to answer the question. I mean, he asked you the question pretty directly. Is it yes or no? State your opinion. You came here with all these opinions. Share your opinion. Rep <laughs> Chairman Lips, Representative Stewart, I did indeed come here with all these opinions because this is my life experience, and then it's 10 years of my life after that experience organizing and counseling these people. So I feel... Uh, the question I was feel very legal, entitled to share my opinions on this, me, excuse and I'm the a little troubled is by legal or le legal or not. That was it's a simple question: legal or not legal, 18 and under. Legal, and I'll be waiting for an apology for being spoken to that way outside. <laughs> uh, you called a committee member careless, and now you're talking back to the chairman. This is a great. Way Thank to you very much for your testimony today, committee. Questions. Representative Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I read all your testimony. Obviously, I, I've listened to it. I didn't see, again, any mention of what is a big component of this bill, which is surgery. So I'll, I'll ask your organization as well. Does Equality Ohio believe that it should be legal in the state of Ohio to remove the penis and testicles of a 15-year-old boy or the breasts of a 15-year-old girl as treatment for gender dysphoria? We are repeating our greatest hits, I see. Nobody's answered it yet. Maybe you will. So, you know, I'm not a doctor. Equality Ohio does not represent doctors. And we firmly believe in the opinions of our medical associations and psychologists. And so we back, um, we back our doctors. You know, we really believe that we should be going with what the doctors are saying. And if the doctors are saying that that's not happening in Ohio, then that is what we believe as well. Well, I'm going to follow up, Mr. Chairman. That wasn't the question, though. The question was, should it be legal in Ohio? And it's a fairly simple yes, no. It's not a gotcha question. Yeah. But it, it's amazing that you, you don't want to answer it. Should it be legal to do that on children, or should it not be legal to do that on children? So through the chair, um, I just want to restate that we are in alignment with what, with what the pediatric hospitals and associations have already previously said. Um, multiple times at this point, um, we are in alignment with the statements of physicians. Um, if they do not believe that this should be legal, then Equality Ohio supports that position. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. So is that you think it should be legal so long as 
your preferred doctor's group says it should be legal, but if they say it should not be legal, you would agree with them. I, I'm, I'm genuinely trying so to understand. So I'm not here to make a medical statement. I am not a doctor. I do not feel comfortable making medical statements. I am happy to answer your question and say that if the pediatric hospitals do not believe that it should be legal, neither do we. Um, but we back doctors. We believe that they know what they're doing. And if they don't think that it should be legal, neither should we. One last follow-up. Uh, I have been reading your organization for as long as I've been in public office uh, with the same talking point that essentially every bill that we're talking about in this building that you don't like uh, means that we're going to deter businesses from investing in the state. You said it before Intel came. You said it before our hospitals all across the state have expanded. You said it before Honda announced they're going to you know, develop one of the largest electric vehicle manufacturing plants in the world in Ohio. Um, do you have any actual data to back up this point that you continue to make over and over and over again? So we do have data. I'd be happy to provide that data afterward. I do not have it on me today. Um, but if I might speak from personal experience for a moment. Um, so I'm 25. I'm Gen Z. Um, all of my friends have left this state. And those that are here are literally embarrassed to be associated with it. And we often say, we joke all the time, that if you go anywhere in this country, there are people from Ohio there, it's because they left. And I am so tired of having to watch my friends and family leave this state because they are literally embarrassed. That is embarrassing. That's embarrassing for every single person in this room. And I could not possibly believe that they wouldn't somehow impact our economy and how we are hiring and developing our workforce. Because my friends don't want to stay here. And that's enough. Well, I'm confused now. Your friends are fleeing Ohio because we introduced HB 68 and we're holding these hearings. Why did your friends leave? Well, they don't feel safe here anymore. I mean, imagine being a kid, a trans kid. Many uh, parents in this room also have transgender children. And if you read through the testimonies, and you know, I get the honor of reading so many of these testimonies and working with these families. And the thing that they talk about is the fear. The fear associated with this bill being introduced is really substantial. I have had families call me upon the introduction of this bill every single year and ask me if they need to leave now. These kids, I mean, I also get the honor of working with many of our trans youth. These kids are scared. Because when they see this on the news, when their parents are talking about it, when they're being used as political pawns in the media, they feel that. They know. They know that they're not welcome here. And so they make plans to leave as soon as they possibly can. I have so many friends. I actually do have friends that have left because of anti-trans legislation in Ohio. And every single time, you never know what, like, what piece of legislation is going to be the nail in someone's coffin. There is no anti-trans legislation in Ohio. Um, we've been discussing it and debating it. And in, in the recent studies from 2022, Ohio was the third most sought after state for business locations, including 48 companies from California. So everybody's not leaving. Representative King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for sharing your personal story. I'd like to follow up on the question that Representative Stewart presented to you, and I'd like to reframe it, since you did share your personal story with your rare blood disease, and I'm grateful that you were able to find the treatment um, to address that. But do you think that it is okay for doctors to remove perfectly healthy body parts from children under the age of 18? Well, first of all, I've always thought that this question was very silly because as someone that experienced what I did with the medical system, I know lots of friends, actually, uh, people in my own life that have had uh, breast tissue or major surgeries because of a disease. Um, and so I understand what the consent process is like for minors, um, and we do it in Ohio all the time. Um, when it comes to this situation, I, once again, um, 
you know, I'm not a doctor. I believe in the uh, I believe in the right and the ability of medical professionals in our state to make those decisions. Um, surgeries aren't currently happening in Ohio, and if they're not happening, it's because they probably shouldn't be happening. Um, and I believe that the doctors have already very thoroughly stated that that is the case. So, follow up. Thank you. I did not ask for a medical opinion. I asked for your personal opinion. Do you feel that it's acceptable for a young child to have their body parts removed, healthy body parts? I mean, you know, again, I really believe that the medical context there matters. Um, we do heart surgeries on infants. So um, we do remove the medical, the body parts of infants regularly for other medical reasons. Um, so, you know, I, I think, again, that the medical situation really matters. And uh, it's up to everyone's own discretion what's right for them and their bodies. But, you know, when, in terms of gender affirming care, those surgeries aren't be pro being provided in Ohio. So I don't necessarily believe that the question is relevant. Up to you. Again, my question is not damage body parts or organs. Healthy body parts, sexual organs, breasts of young women. Do you personally, not a medical opinion, do you believe it is appropriate to remove healthy body tissue and body parts? So, through the chair. Um, so when it comes to breast removal and augmentation, I think that that's very different as the physicians have already kind of talked about. Um, people get breast implants, but like survivors get uh, breast tissue removed. This is very, very common for Ohio's young people and something that parents have been able to consent to for a long time. Um, do I think that, you know, again, I'm just gonna state, surgeries aren't happening here. And I, you know, I've been asked this question three times and I'm done answering it. So if anyone else has another question, I'd be happy to answer it. You're done answering it, but you didn't answer it. So we'll just make sure we point that out as a matter of the record. At this time, I want to back up and go around to a comment that was made earlier about attacks on detransitioners. Um, being from detransitioners or the anti-trans community. I've been managing this bill for five months as the chairman of the committee and in fact have not found that to be true. I found that the attacks on detransitioners that we've interviewed in our office were from the trans community. So I want to make that as a clarification. 